finish up the endocrine system and um, move on into the next chapter, which is the blood uh, chapter. All right, so last time we talked a lot about uh, blood glucose regulation, insulin, glucagon, and then I talked for quite a bit about diabetes and how, how it happens and what it does. But to wrap up this chapter, we have two uh, sort of big topics in terms of how the um, endocrine system integrates it with itself to accomplish important things. So the first one of those is growth. You know, when we look at the human being from newborn to adult, profound change occurs, you know, in size, in shape, in capability, in metabolism, in, you know, just about every aspect of um, the, the living organism changes at least a little over growth. And in order to make this amazing thing happen, you have to have a functioning endocrine system. In particular, you have to have a very well-functioning endocrine system. Because in order for this to happen, all of these hormones have to be working properly and responding um, to uh, their neighbor hormones, as well as um, the cells of the body have to respond to these hormones too. So insulin certainly plays a role um, in uh, generating growth. In other words, energy goes in, nutrition goes in, and some of that nutrition doesn't come back out. It becomes increased muscle mass, longer bones, increased adipose tissue, more skin, more hair, all those things. So insulin plays a role in um, uh, triggering what we call anabolism, which is the building up of tissue. And then our calcium hormones, uh, par parathyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin. Calcitriol is just another name for vitamin D, so we did talk about calcitriol. Have to have those in order to maintain bone health and grow longer, thicker bones. Um, the thyroid hormones, we talked a lot about last time, so you have to have those for growth. They're necessary for growth of normal brain tissue. Um, the brain doesn't really stop growing until about 25 in most people. Um, and that whole time, thyroid hormone has to be present in normal amounts to have normal uh, brain growth and cognitive development. Growth hormone, obviously, is probably the easiest to recognize because it has growth in its name. Um, <clears throat> growth hormone, in many ways, regulates the process of getting taller and bigger. Okay, So the mass and height of the human being are very much determined by growth hormone. Now, that doesn't mean that shorter, smaller people have less growth hormone than taller, bigger people do. Most of that is genetics. You know, the... Growth hormone gets you to whatever height your genes say you're going to be, right? So it isn't that you can give extra growth hormone and make somebody taller necessarily um, because genes play a, probably a larger role there. And then the, the gonadal hormones play a major role between child and adult. You know, we call that puberty, adolescence, um, whatever. And without normal functioning pituitary gland, hypothalamus, and gonads, ovary in the, in the female, may, uh, test, testes in the male, you're not going to have this transformation from child to adult. So a lot of good stuff on this slide. Really, this is all talking about how these hormones interact to create this metamorphosis, you know, from little tiny comma-shaped newborn to um, elaborately complex adult, um, male or female. All right, so that's growth. <clears throat> okay, the second big topic of what does the endocrine system do for us in, in complicated terms is this thing called the stress response, also called the general adaptation syndrome. Okay, some of this we talked about last semester. This first box, the alarm phase, this is that fight or flight response of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so we get the adrenal medulla gets involved floods the body with adrenaline and noradrenaline. And then the, the rest of the sympathetic nervous system also participates to make things happen like um, uh, vasoconstriction and vasodilation to put blood to the skeletal muscle where you can fight or flee. Um, and in the end, this fight or flight response, we call that the alarm phase because you know the alarm is, ah, it's mountain lion. 
right? So what response? What's the response to that? Well, it's all of these very fast changes. Okay, so this fight or flight system kicks in, you know, in seconds and does the things you'd expect: increased mental alertness, energy use, mobilization of nutrients, um, so that there's plenty of, of uh, fuel to burn for the muscle and brain. Um, the changes in circulation, blood goes more to the muscles, less to the digestive organs, right? Because you've got to fight or flee, not necessarily digest at that point. Um, <clears throat> an increase in heart rate and respiratory rate to get plenty of oxygen and blood flow moving through the body, optimally adapting the body for uh, maximal action. Okay, so that's the odds amount of life. All right, the second phase is what we call the resistance phase. This is a bit more hard a bit more difficult to understand. And you have to understand where this comes from. You know, we didn't always live in nice houses and, you know, uh, have very s relatively safe and protected lives from the environment. Well, <clears throat> after that fight or flight scenario, chances are you could be injured, right? Mountain lion got the best of you. You could have burned through a lot of energy stores. You know, you had to really run to say, you know, run for your life, so to speak. So the resistance phase kicks in to promote survival. Okay, so the fight or flight phase, that alarm phase, is to is to promote maximal activity. In other words, be as strong as you are, smart as you are, fast as you are, to avoid as much injury as possible. Well, in the resistance phase, this is about survival. It's to keep you alive, even if you've been injured, even if you have you run out of your typical metabolic nutrients, because that run from the mountain line was a lot further than you know you, the longest run you've ever made, or whatever. Okay. So the key players in the resistance phase are uh, the adrenal cortex and that ACTH hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Um, the pancreas plays a little bit of a role, and the, uh, um, the renin angiotensin system plays a role. We're going to talk more about that in another chapter. Just let me pause. This stuff, this slide right here, put later. <laughs> okay? Because we're going to talk about this in the cardiovascular system. We're not going to talk about it today. But that's this box right here. Okay, so in the resistance phase, the body sets itself up to, um, uh, con to conserve as much energy as possible and to use whatever metabolic resources are still in the body, okay? So, for example, <clears throat> in this resistance phase, aldosterone is released, one of the, the mineralocorticoids, and that helps the body to conserve sodium. Okay, so imagine you didn't do so well with the mountain lion, you're injured. Okay, if you're injured, your mobility is decreased, and that means your ability to find food and other nutrients is decreased, right? So you're going to have trouble getting water, you're going to have trouble getting food, because your legs all tore up by the mountain lion. Okay, so if you conserve salt, and if you conserve water, that's going to increase your likelihood for survival, because... You are injured, so you have less needs in the resistance phase. Okay, so that's one piece. The biggest piece, I think, is this middle section. The adrenal cortex releases glucocorticoids. Those are those steroids, cortisol, cortisone. They have lots of effects, but one of those is to conserve glucose. In other words, to tell the body to use any other fuel but glucose and save the glucose for the brain. Why? Because we only have so much glucose reserve in the body. You know, the liver has enough glycogen stored for the brain to survive on that alone for about 12 hours. Okay, after that, the brain is going to have to get its glucose from somewhere else, and that's going to be the liver producing glucose from other things, like protein and lipid. Okay, well, if we're short on glucose, then the best thing to do is use as little of it as possible. So that's what the glucocorticoids do, is they tell the peripheral tissues, the non-brain tissues, don't use glucose, use any other kind of fuel that you can. Okay, and that saves the glucose reserves for the brain. Okay. Another, because of this conservation of glucose, the, act, the blood glucose level actually goes up. 
because none of the cells are using it except for the brain. So under in this resistance phase, blood sugars are higher than normal. So that gives the brain plenty of fuel um, to do its thing without tapping into the rest of the body's um, uh, nutrient reserves. Okay, so that's this one. And then, uh, well, we already talked about that, conserve salt and conserve water. So all of these things accomplish the same thing, which is to lower the body's demands so that you have time to recover from whatever your injury that resulted was, uh, came from here. One thing your book does not talk about here is that the immune response is actually suppressed in the resistance phase. And that might seem counterintuitive. You know, if you've been tore up by a mountain lion, don't you want to have a very vigorous immune system to keep you from getting infected? No, because the more important thing in the short term is to survive the encounter. Infection takes time to happen, right? So in that initial resistance phase, the immune system is actually turned down so that, that, <clears throat> so that the body's resources can be used in other things. Not a perfect system. You know, one of the reasons that wounds become infected in trauma is because of this immune suppression. <clears throat> But in the short term, wild life, you know, no medicine, no health care, you know, you're out there in the wild, you're living the life of a primate, <clears throat> this resistance phase does result in survival. That's why it exists in evolution. Now, another interesting point about this is in us human beings, we can get ourselves into a fight or flight response or a resistance phase without actually any mountain lions. Right? We call this stress in our common American vocabulary. So, you know, you're, you're working two jobs and you're trying to keep your grades up in college. Well, there's no mountain lion, but the body responds in many ways like there is. So the immune response is turned down, blood sugars are high, the body is placed in this conservation mode, and over the long term, that has lots of negative effects. It's bad for the cardiovascular system, it's bad for the respiratory system, it's bad for the brain, it's bad for the bones, it's bad for the muscles. So this is not the greatest thing for us humans, particularly in our medically advanced uh, world, but we have to know that it happens because it's not just mountain lions that trigger this. Any illness, any uh, stress to the body's normal is going to trigger in some, to some degree this resistance phase. So let's say you have somebody who is fighting a long-term illness, okay? They've got cirrhosis of the liver, let's say. And um, so their body is already a little bit in this resistance phase. And then they get the flu, right? Somebody coughed on them at the grocery store. Now that second hit can often result in this last part, which is where you get the exhaustion phase. If the person is already using all their resources to, to fight whatever illness they have, and then they get an additional challenge on top of that, the bottom can drop out of this whole thing. So <clears throat> that is what we call exhaustion. This is where the body's internal metabolic reserves are spent. They're gone. So the body essentially starts taking, it, taking itself apart in an effort to stay alive. And at some point, as the breakdown of those structural proteins occurs, um, you start getting a, a huge increase in infection because your immune system is one of the first things to go. It's already been suppressed, but now you're running out of nutrients and it starts to fall off. The cardiovascular system collapses because this renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system that we're going to talk about later, eventually this runs out. You know, it can keep you alive with not enough blood for a couple of days. But if you don't get that fixed, the cardiovascular system starts to suffer. And in the end, the exhaustion phase results in death. All right. So many of the deaths that occur as a result of a multi-step process, what's really ending that person's life is this exhaustion phase. You know, so you all have probably heard about multi-organ failure or multi-organ system failure. Well, in some ways, this exhaustion phase is another name for that. You know, once the system of resistance starts to break down, resistance to death, that's what this means, resistance to death, then the whole thing starts to collapse. And you get one problem after another after another. And even modern medicine can oftentimes not save folks like that. 
Because what you can't do is we can't reach in and replace this intrinsic resistance system. We can do some things, and we do do some things, like this phase does. But ultimately, if the body is out of resources and there isn't any way to repair or fix the damage, this is what's going to result. All right. Yes? So, like, how long could you be in each stage for without moving on to the next one? Fight or flight never lasts more than a couple of hours at the most, and that's because the adrenal medulla runs out of epi and norepi, so it runs out of adrenaline, and the, it, the sympathetic nervous system causes the body to spend energy. So when that, ener when that readily available energy is spent, it has to go into this resistance phase. So this is never more than a couple of hours. People can live in this for a long, long time. You know, so people that have a chronic illness, you know, like hepatitis C, for example, or even early HIV, they'll be in resi the resistance phase for years and years. Um, because it's doing its job, it's keeping the patient alive, it just can't solve the problem. Um, if, you, if the resistance phase can allow enough time and energy to fix whatever the initial insult was, then you go the opposite way, right? Then you go from this back out of it and back into normal. And then the exhaustion phase, people can linger there for six months or a year, but usually not more. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Can you go back from the exhaustion phase? You can, but the typical rule is, in order to do that, whatever your original problem has to get fixed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So either the bleeding has to be stopped, or the wound has to be closed, or if it's an illness, the illness has to be cured or at least treated better than it has been. So you need something, you need a fix to go from here back to here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, all, all the positive thinking in the world is not going to do it. <laughs> you've, you've got to, the thing, the initial problem has to get fixed. And um, so you see this in hospitals a lot. You know, practically everybody who is in the hospital for a good reason, they're at least already in the resistance phase, right? So this is a person whose, whose physiology has really been challenged already. It's one of the reasons why secondary infection in hospital is so high, is people are already stressed, they're already in this resistance phase, their immune system is depressed, then you put them in a bed next to somebody with a, a nasty pneumonia, and what happens? They, they trade bugs, and then both get sick. So um, <clears throat> you all will hear a lot about this on your clinical rotation when you get there. All right. And then I'm just gonna talk a little bit about disorders. Essentially, you know, what can go wrong with the endocrine system? Um, you can either have too much secretion of hormone, too little, or some not appropriate response to the hormones that are present. So in the case of too little um, hormone secretion, you know, you can have physical damage to the gland. Um, you can have uh, something you were born with where you don't make that hormone properly in the first place. Um, or you can have some other metabolic factor. You know, so um, uh, a medication you're on, there are medications that inhibit certain hormones um, and that kind of thing. So like, like we talked about iodine in the diet. If you don't have enough iodine, your thyroid can't produce thyroid hormone, right? All right, so we've got hyposecretion. Hypersecretion is less common um, and it can result from cancer. You've got too many, you've got cells that are dividing out of control but still producing the hormone. You know, that happens in the thyroid gland. It can happen in the adrenals too. Um, <clears throat> or you've got a problem in the pituitary or hypothalamus system where the, the basically the brain is misreading the signals and is calling for more hormone than you actually need. All right. So I don't talk a lot about this because this is a topic we'll cover a lot in pathophysiology where we learn about the disease processes. So it's coming. But just pictures are fun, right? <clears throat> so some endocrine disorders. See this guy, see how his head is super long compared, like look at his shoulders, okay? So that is a, a big tall head, right? <laughs> and if you look, he has quite generous ears and a rather large nose. And you see this space between his nose and his upper lip, how that's longer than it is in most people. This is a syndrome that we call acromegaly. And acromegaly results from too much growth hormone after puberty or after um, the bones have closed, right? This is more common than you think. 
if you look around grocery stores and uh, uh, football games and things like that, sometimes you can spot the acromegaly. Um, oftentimes, the folks are pretty tall anyway because they were over-secreting growth hormone before puberty too. So acromegaly. You also see these people have big hands and feet too, typically. All right, this is a goiter. We talked about this last time. If you look at her neck, see that big thing there? That's a thyroid gland trying to produce thyroid hormone without iodine. So when, we, when you look and see the salt is iodized in our grocery stores, it's to prevent that kind of thing. Um, and goiters are not gone in the world. Um, they are still uh, present in inland um, developing nations. You see them. Uh, all right, so that's that one. See this baby, and looks a little bit like Down syndrome. If anybody has, has if you've, any of you have seen Down syndrome babies, it isn't though. This is what happens when a baby doesn't have adequate thyroid hormone during um, uh, gestation, during development. And this pattern continues if that thyroid hormone problem isn't fixed with medication after delivery, too. So um, as part of prenatal care, moms are routinely checked for thyroid hormone levels and for TSH levels to try to prevent this from happening. So um, <clears throat> you see the tongue is a little bit bigger, too big for the mouth. The eyes are uh, narrow, and the nose is kind of flat. Um, and you can't tell this from a picture. These babies are very floppy. That's why you just see the arms are like that. Most of the time, babies don't lay like that. Floppy babies do, though. So uh, the <clears throat> muscle tone is reduced because the thyroid hormone isn't present, so they're floppy. They lay in whatever position their limbs fall in. All right. And then <clears throat> here is a Cushing's disease called Cushinoid. Too much glucocorticoids, either from your own body or taken by mouth or by IV, because we use glucocorticoids to treat lots of things. You get a big round face. If you saw this guy from the side, it would, his face would be very flat. We call that moon faces. Their faces look like moons, round and flat. You see redness in the cheeks here. Um, and if you saw the rest of him, um, you'd see a, a particular fat distribution that goes with Cushing's disease, and that is um, a lot of abdominal fat, a lot of truncal uh, adipose tissue. And this is the opposite disorder. This is Addison's disease. You can't see it very well, but there's a, a sort of dark rash here, kind of like a suntan color. Um, and it's one of the responses to a body that's trying to generate more corticosteroids but can't for whatever reason. Um, so that's the least good picture. But some interesting disorders. Those of you that will see patients in your life, you're going to see this. You're probably not going to see this unless you go overseas. You shouldn't see this in this country because we, have, we went after cretinism a long time ago. And that really isn't the most politically correct term anymore. The, the, it's thyroid deficiency. Um, uh, thyroid hormone deficiency, but we check moms and then we check babies um, before they go home for this, so we don't have babies that look like that. You'll see lots of these um, cushionoid syndrome from people who've been who are dealing with autoimmune disease diseases, you know, like Crohn's disease, for example. They tend to look like this because they have to take so many steroids. You had a question? Yeah, is there a cure for Addison's disease? Yes, Addison's disease you can cure by giving steroids on the outside. It ultimately like, depends on the cause. Is it like illegal in some states or something? Because I know someone who has to go to California to get treatment and it's super expensive. And For Addison's disease? Yeah. That's surprising. Maybe she has some strange diagnosis that the well, insurance she has company like doesn't a believe. Like pacemaker and stuff too. Like, does that cause heart problems? It can. I mean, one of the problems with Addison's disease is the, those patients don't do this very well. They don't do the resistance phase very well because they don't She's have this. Yeah. yeah, and Addison's disease means you don't have a resistance phase, which means puts these two a little bit closer. So yeah, patients with Addison's are usually really brittle. So does that cause death? Does Addison's cause death? It can. It can. It can be a, a player in death, too. Yeah. 
And this is a little glimpse of things to come. This is just a few of the endocrine disorders. So one of the reasons we learn this stuff now is we learn how normal works because abnormal gets a lot more complicated, right? Because there's only one normal, but there could be 5, 10, 20 different abnormal ways things can work. So get ready. You know, we'll deal with that later. Okay, and I'm going to skip questions because we're behind already. But, and most of those questions are not about things we covered. All right, questions about endocrine before we go on. Okay, homework due tonight, don't forget, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> typically the homework will be due on the day we start the next chapter. So that's kind of how I have it arranged. So if you know we just finished, know the homework will be due the next time we meet. I like to have homework due when we on days we meet so I can remind you, right? Okay, good stuff. Endocrine system. Okay, so now we change gears. I don't like to change gears in the middle of class, but I had no choice this time. <clears throat> so chapter 17, we're going to talk mostly about this first topic. So there's blood, and then there's the vessels they travel through. All right, we're going to talk about the blood vessel characteristics in general, but the, uh, the names of the blood vessels and where they are, that's going to be more independent study. Right? I don't think that anatomy, names of things and where they are, is learned very well in a classroom like this. Okay, So <clears throat> this is really, in this second semester, the blood vessels are the only piece of anatomy that there's a fair chunk of. Okay, Now, for you all, because you, had, you did regional anatomy, we did regional anatomy last semester, you will have learned a lot of these vessels already. Okay, But we're going to get to that at the end of this chapter. So, really, for the next month and a half, month anyway, this is really going to be our topic, is the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. So, we divide it up. This is all stuff you should have learned in, in elementary school, I think. But, you know, you've got a heart in the center. That's the pump. You've got blood vessels carrying um, arterial blood out. They're in red. And veins carrying uh, deoxygenated blood back. And then in between those, we have capillaries. So arteries become capillaries, capillaries become veins, veins go back to the heart. And then circulating through this system of tubes with the big pump in the middle is what we call blood. So what exactly is blood and what does it do? Well, that's the topic for today. <clears throat> so for all of our organ systems, there's going to be a slide like this. Endocrine, we don't, there's not one because it's a different kind of system, but for the rest of them, there's going to be a functions of slide. And the reason I'm pointing this out is the body likes to do more than one thing with what it has. So while every organ system in the body has a principal function or functions, there are also secondary and tertiary functions too, because we are a very integrated organism. You know, we as human beings have we like to take things apart and think of things in pieces, pieces working together. And that's fine when we look at anatomy and physiology, but we also have to remember the whole thing fits together, too. So all of the pieces do more than one thing. So the first one here, transportation of dissolved gases, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic wastes. This is the principal function of blood. It's to move stuff around. It's to move oxygen from the lungs to the cells, it's to move carbon dioxide from the cells to the lungs. It's to move things like glucose and proteins and lipids from the digestive tract to the cells. And then the waste products go from the cells back to the kidneys to be removed from the body. So it's our transportation system. And just about everything goes into and out of the blood um, <clears throat> so that all the cells can get all they need. And essentially, it allows every cell in our body to use all of the organs of our body. So it makes us very uh, effective organisms. So that's the principal one. But it does other things too. The blood is the principal regulator of pH as well as ion composition. So sodium, potassium, calcium, their levels in the body are regulated by the constant flow of blood, as is pH. And pH is so important, we're going to spend um, a class session or two just talking about it after um, if, later in the spring. So pH 
and ions are in the blood. Blood, unlike a fluid that you, you know, would buy at the grocery store, so to speak, is active, right? Blood clots, and it's one of the coolest things it does because it means that our cardiovascular system is self-sealing. You know, you get a hole in your radiator pipe in your car, and all the fluid leaks out, right? Well, in the blood or in the body, you get a hole in a blood vessel, and a little blood leaks out. But before long, it seals itself back up. So it's self-sealing. We're going to talk about coagulation and clotting um, later on uh, in this chapter. So we'll see how that happens. The blood is one of the sources of the immune system activity. The white blood cells, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, are some of the major players in defending us against a world that would really like to live on our resources, right? You know, Earth is very competitive. So there are always organisms in our environment that would very much like to live on the inside of us where we keep them warm and we keep them fed and we keep their waste products down. Um, <clears throat> so the immune system is present in the blood to help prevent that. And then just like the coolant in your car, the blood does act as, uh, or, uh, or the blood is the way the body regulates its temperature. Okay, so every cell of your body produces heat. We're warm-blooded organisms. That means we, um, some of the energy that we burn comes out as heat. We have to get rid of that heat, or just like your car, you'll overheat and die. So one of the ways we move heat around the body is in the blood. So the blood is actually a little warmer than the rest of the body so that it can carry heat out to the skin and into the lungs where then that heat is radiated um, out into the environment. So we have our five principal functions of blood. Most of what we talk about though is this first one. So what is this stuff? Okay, well it comes out of your body looking like this and it's a mixture. We call this whole blood. Whole blood's what's circulating in you right now, mm -hmm. okay? So if we take that blood and we put it in a centrifuge, the heavy stuff gets pulled towards uh, the outside of the centrifuge and the light watery stuff stays at the middle. So the light watery stuff we call plasma and the heavy stuff, which are for the most part inside cell membranes, we call those the formed elements. And it's about a 60-40 ratio. So there's a range. Everybody in this room will have a different um, percent formed elements, but it's about 60-40 is the, is the rule of thumb to remember. 60% plasma, 40% formed elements. All right. So what is this whole blood stuff like? Well, it's a little warmer than body temperature. I already talked about that. It is much more viscous than water. So viscosity is how thick a fluid is. Technically, it's it's resistance to flow. So examples. Acetone, nail polish remover, right, flows really easily, more, even more easily than water does. Whereas vegetable oil takes a lot longer to flow, and molasses takes really, really, really long time to flow. That's viscosity. The thicker the fluid, the less it flows, and blood is about five times as viscous as water. Um, so that's significant. You know, it means that uh, <clears throat> blood, for example, if you've ever had a bad cut or bet around somebody who has, blood's hard to clean up, right? And it's because it's so viscous, it tends to stick to stuff. Not to mention, it's always trying to clot on you. Um, so five times as viscous and slightly alkaline. The pH of blood, which this is a number you're going to have to know, so might as well start now, is 7.4 plus or minus 0.05. Okay, so in other words, 7.35 to 7.45. And that's a range we're going to talk about a number of different times. Not much today, but just so you have that early. Slightly alkaline. You know, water is 7, so it's a little bit more basic than that. <clears throat> so in, if, once we break this whole blood up into its pieces, the formed elements are mostly red blood cells which we're going to talk quite a bit about. And then we have a few white blood cells, which are all immune system cells. And then we have quite a few platelets, but they're really, really tiny. <laughs> so they don't make up a very big percentage 
And the platelets pay, play a major role in blood clotting and coagulation. They help keep the blood in your blood vessels where it belongs. In the plasma, we have mostly water, right? 92% water. Then we have about 7% of proteins and 1% of other. But that other is really important stuff, like sodium, potassium, calcium, those kinds of things, right? So we're going to look at the two parts separately, and we're going to start with the plasma. Okay, so 7% of plasma are proteins, and these proteins come from a variety of sources, but the single biggest provider of plasma proteins is the liver. One of the things the liver does very well is to produce proteins that do different things. All right, so we have four, um, <clears throat> three big classes of these plasma proteins. The albumins are proteins that do very little except exist. And here's what I mean by that. The liver creates a bunch of albumins, and the presence of those molecules in the plasma helps to keep the, uh, the fluid of the body in the vessels and circulating where it belongs. So you have all, I think, um, heard, you've talked about osmosis before in the past, right? Well, one of the ways our bodies use that physical, um, uh, the physical existence of osmosis is by, we create albumins, and those albumins, because there's a bunch of them, are always pulling water in towards them. You know, just like a very salty mixture pulls water in, well, these albumins, because there's a bunch of them, they're always pulling water into the blood vessels. We call that the colloid osmotic pressure. More on that later. Okay, so that's one big, this is the most. Of all the plasma proteins, about 60% of that is, are the albumins. So that's the biggest one. Then we have the globulins. Um, that's about 35%. Globulins come in two basic varieties. Immunoglobulins is a fancy name for antibodies, okay? So immunoglobulins are globular proteins that um, uh, work with the immune system to identify things by sticking to them. The other big group of globulins are transport um, proteins, like thyroid binding globulin that we talked about last time. So a glob, you know, is a sort of complex sheet thing, so it has lots of little nooks and crannies. And the immunoglobulins use those nooks and crannies to stick to stuff that doesn't belong. The transport globulins use those nooks and crannies to carry stuff, the st stuff gets stuck to them. About 4% is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is the principal protein that, pr uh, that creates blood clots when they're needed. So the reason our blood can self-seal like it does is the, the precursor for a blood clot is present in the blood all the time. So, you know, when you cut yourself and the blood starts to clot almost immediately, it's because the body didn't have to make anything. It was already there. It just had to activate it. So it means that the clotting system is very quick. All right. And then the remaining little bits, um, you know, proteins do all kinds of things. You know, there's enzymes in the blood, both active and inactive. Um, technically, some of the hormones are small proteins. You know, so there's a wide variety of other there, but these top three are the big players. They make up most of what you find in the plasma proteins. All right. And then the 1%, okay, other usually doesn't matter, but in this case, other matters quite a bit because the other things in the blood are things that you've heard about before. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, uh, bicarbonate, we're going to talk a ton about later on, um, uh, uh, phosphate and um, sulfates as well all play a role in our body's metabolism. So we call those electrolytes because they carry a charge, right? And like you saw in the nervous system chapter and the muscle chapter last semester, those charge carrying things do some pretty impressive stuff and stuff we would really hate to miss, you know, like cause muscles to contract and nerves to fire. So that's in the 1%. Also in the 1% are things going out to the cells or back from the cells. So all the cells in the body need nutrients, and those nutrients have to come from somewhere, uh, particularly the digestive tract or the liver, depending on if you've got food coming in or not. Um, so that's in that 1%. The 
Those are things like lipids, carbohydrates, amino acids, and their various types. And then once the cells have processed those nutrients, they end up creating waste products. So obviously CO2 is the, is the largest waste product, but there's also nitrogen wastes. Um, there's also um, uh, inorganic acids that are made. Lots of different things that cells end up making as waste products. They enter the blood, go to the kidney or the liver, and are then removed from the body by those two means. So we have plasma proteins and then those other solutes. And then don't forget, we've got 92% of that is water. All right. Well, what's in the other section? Okay, so now we're down here, the formed elements. Now, we call them formed elements because we can't call them cells, because not all of them are cells, right? So the reason we call them formed elements instead of cells is platelets are not cells, but they, are, they do live in a cell membrane, okay? So the formed elements, most of that are the red blood cells, so like 99.9, .9, I think it is percent of the form elements are these guys, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. The platelets uh, are, are, shell, are cell fragments. So um, platelets form when little pieces of a giant cell in the bone marrow kind of flake off, you know, um, like paint flaking off a wall. And then those fragments circulate around the body and they contain um, coagulation enzymes that help to Blood, blood to clot very quickly. And then we have our family of white blood cells, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. And we're going to talk about each one of these um, when we get there uh, next night. So that's it. So there's platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. That's what's in the formed elements. All right. And our first uh, uh, formed element that we talked about is the red blood cell. And I know all of you paid attention to biology class in high school, right? So you've heard of the red blood cell. You know a little bit about its shape. Um, it is a flattened disc. It's a smallish cell, as cells in the body go. Red blood cells are usually about a half to a quarter of the size of other cells. So they're, they're little tiny things compared to, um, you know, like a white blood cell or an epithelial cell, for example, are much, much larger than these. When we look at them under the microscope, they look like circles, and that's because we're seeing through this thin part in the middle. So they look like donuts, right? Even though there isn't a hole in the middle, there's just a thin spot. And um, the shape is uh, uh, really is like this. I mean, this is right under the microscope or the scanning electron microscope. So you can see they really do have this flattened disc shape. You know, why of all the shapes they could have, why this one? This is the greatest surface area to volume ratio that you can get from a thing that starts as a sphere, right? So a sphere has a relatively small surface to volume ratio. But if you take that sphere and you push its two poles in together like this, then you dramatically decrease the volume of it while you keep the surface area the same. So the reason red blood cells have this shape is so that there's a lot of cell membrane for the amount of volume that it has. Now, why? Because it's across this cell membrane is where oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to move. You know, so red blood cells, their principal job is to deliver oxygen and carry carbon dioxide back to the lungs. So to do that most effectively, they need lots of cell membrane for the amount of volume that they have. So thus, we have the flattened disc shape. Now, another feature of this shape is that it can make stacks. You know, just like you can stack quarters very neatly together, you can stack red blood cells very neatly together. You see this stack of them from the side there? Um, we call that a rouleau, and it allows red blood cells to travel more efficiently through vessels, particularly through small vessels. So, you know, you think about, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, traffic, You've got lots of lanes, right, and they, they all funnel into one or two lanes, and there's a big backup. But once you get into that two-lane traffic, it flows pretty quickly, right, because they're, everything's stacked in a row. Well, that's what this uh, rouleau is like in the blood um, vessels. It, they sort of flow almost like a slinky, you know, through the vessels, and um, it's more efficient that way. And finally, the flattened disc shape makes these guys flexible. You know, the cell membranes are flexible to begin with, 
But this shape, it means you can twist it, right? Like if you take a Frisbee, you know, you can twist it pretty easily. You can bend it, you know, you can start to fold it. And in the capillaries, many of our capillaries are smaller in diameter than red blood cells are wide, which means they have to be flexible to squeeze through. Um, you know, it's like taking a, a, a Nerf ball and pushing it through, you know, a hole that's smaller than the ball. You have to kind of squeeze it through, but you can do it. Red blood cells can do that too. They can squeeze and get through narrow openings that way. Um, so flexibility, rouleaux, and large surface area to volume ratio. Ooh, maybe we can maybe end with a movie. All right, I'm going to turn lights off. So <clears throat> we see, we can see red blood cells moving. So typically you see, oh no, it's not available. What? Shoot. Oh man. All right, I'll have to show that to you next time. That, I've got this cool video that shows microcirculation where you can see the red cells zipping by. Mine's working. Is it working? Mine is like you're walking down. Use that preview. Like you right click it and press preview. This on this? Will it work? Oh. Nope. See the computers are dumb. Right. Okay, so some of you can see it anyway. <laughs> and it is cool. And what it shows you is those are all done in real time. So cock your head and look at somebody who's got a laptop so you can see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you see that? So, you know, these red cells are literally flowing. And another feature of that shape is it means they're nice and smooth. So even when they do bump into each other, it's like bumper cars. They just bump and, and go off. They don't get stuck together because they have this nice circle around them. Why is, like, is when you bleed, like, is, is it kind of sticky because of the plasma? Correct. It's sticky because of the plasma. Because as soon as blood is exposed to air, the clotting system activates, and it, the clotting system tries to stick red cells together. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll call it a day there. Yes. Oh, the red cells, they'll do that. They'll stick together a little bit. It's not really a clot. Oh, okay. It's more that they're sticky a little. Okay. Plus, when they go to make these films, usually, the, because they're from animals, the skin has been removed. So that's the immune system is starting to get involved. Uh, yeah. Is that dangerous? Like when they're in clots, if they're small vessels, not usually, because let's say it gets they get stuck. The pressure behind it will break it up, um, unless they're stuck together like a clot. Is